Mr. Computer, please. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Phil Stark World, Com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www. Options clearing. Com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on a specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss as you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, fantastic. How's everybody doing today? Having fun? Markets have been very strange, up and down, all over the place. Let's see what we have today. Uh, bum, bum, bum. And I see nothing. What's wrong with this thing? Hmm, that was weird. Taking a long time to draw. Okay, so we're not going to reboot now that I got everything going. All right, so what's going on? The most important thing going on is oil is blasted higher along with Brent and along with uh, gasoline. They did have a good inventory um, with, a, with a very big draw. We're going to take a look at that in a few minutes. We'll see what happened. And uh, the markets are still trying to jam themselves as high as they possibly can. Um, Lloyd Blankfein just came out and said nice things about the market. The funniest thing is he said commodity prices are are subdued, and meanwhile, look, look at silver. <laughs> I hope you guys listen to me as they go along on silver. Um, silver's blasted up. Uh, I'm sure gold is not far behind. Gold, actually, gold is far behind. Look, gold's not gold's not flying the way silver is. Um, that's that's a huge move in silver, so that's really good. Uh, the dollar's actually come up, and we say buy the dollar at 89, and we got a little bounce off 89 there. Uh, the S&P, we had a nice pullback. See, two mornings in a row, we have a nice pullback, but then it drifts higher. So, you know, you can make your money on the pullback and then wait and see what happens afterwards. That's where we are now. Um, there's no good reason. So far, there's no good reason to short oil. That's the first thing we're going to look at, and then we'll look at the portfolios. So my agenda is full because it's going to take a while to look at all these positions. Uh, this is the rollover period. We did the review for the... Uh, <laughs> for the butterfly portfolio so far officially the next one i'm going to do is um i got the oop the stp and the long-term portfolio funny thing i noticed though that we didn't touch the oop since last month we didn't make a single trade since the last review which was like in the middle of march so um that's very interesting it's unusual too so let's see uh wait first we're going to look for the thing Thing first, then the other thing. Um, petroleum. Whoop. There it is. Are you typing when I don't have to? I can't wait till it's artificial intelligence. Like when I say, let's just go to the thing, and the and the uh, Watson will go, okay, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's kind of my job with my mom. Cause my mom said, my mom has the same habit. She's like, oh, let's do that thing that we said we were going to do. And I'm, and I'm, it's my job in the family to. Uh, to know what she's talking about. <laughs> she's like, you know the place where we met the guy? I'm like, oh, yeah, Stan. She's like, yeah, Stan, that's it. <laughs> so let's see. 
this is this today april 13th right okay <clears throat> so we have oil imports 8 million barrels a day uh which is down oh 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 look at this okay so here's how you get the bullshit inventory numbers uh let's start at the beginning this is today's uh, thingy and oil inventory is 10 30. Ten thirty, ten thirty. Where was it? There. Okay. So oil was down one point one million barrels. Gasoline down three. Diesel is down three. That's seven million barrels down. So oh my God, how could we suddenly have a seven million barrel deficit in oil? Well, you know how? Because we imported. 720,000 barrels a day less from the previous week per day. That's uh, 5 million barrels right there. It's just a lack of importing. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, so over the last four weeks, blah, 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 blah. So that, that's right there, a huge part of it. Also, then you look at your exports. It's, well, we're still exporting 3 million barrels a day of oil. It's unbelievable. So it's not really U.S. demand. It's that we're sending 21 million barrels a week out of the country. In fact, I'm going on um, TV tomorrow. I'm going to talk about this over at the NASDAQ. It's a real bullshit story. Uh, of course, we had an article about the Saudis. Where are they? Uh... Whoops. What's going on here? Up, up. Saudi Arabia wants oil. For, oh, here you go. Saudi Arabia. They, they flat out tell you they're looking to push oil to $100 a barrel. So up 50% from where it is right now. That's their goal is to charge you 50% more for gasoline and oil at the tank so they can take their, their Ramco company public at a high IPO price, which I've been saying for years. I've been, I've been saying they're doing this for ages. This has been the whole plan has been pushing oil up. And that, unfortunately, is why we haven't been so gung-ho to short it this year because it's uh, we, it's nothing we can do about it. It's gonna, it's, they're going to keep pushing it up. Now, I, would be, I wouldn't be gung-ho to go long because I think that there's the overwhelming fundamental lack of demand that's being completely ignored. But at some point, that story is going to overtake it. And I think this might be their uh, Waterloo. So in other words, they're, they're, they're now getting greedy. They got oil to 70, which was their original goal. It's just, you know, Brent, Brent oil to 70. So they got oil to 70, which is their original goal. And now they're saying, ooh, let's do 100. And when it's to 100, they want to do 120. When it's to 120, they want 150. Because that's all they do is sell oil. That's their whole thing. <laughs> they don't have anything else. They just sell oil. And it makes them unbelievably rich, but still they just sell oil. And I think I told you guys that stupid prince of Saudi Arabia kicked me out of my hotel suite. <laughs> I'm really angry about that. Where were we? Um, oh, in DC, we were in DC and we were at the uh, Four Seasons and we had a suite, which we were gonna have for the family. It was gonna get a suite. So instead they bumped us out of the suite and gave us three different rooms in the hotel um to trade for the suite which they said was the same square footage blah 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 but it's not the same thing you know um and uh and it was because the stupid uh, prince took the whole floor of the hotel with his uh, entourage there it, was, I mean, it would seem like there were a lot more people than that i think because you know about half the people in the hotel were arabs <laughs> but i don't know what the deal was exactly but he did definitely took the entire floor at the top of the hotel and they kicked us out. That's what I couldn't believe. That they said we we're sorry that the uh, we, you're, you know a room we had reserved was taken away from us. Anyhow, so that's my anger at Saudi Arabia. So uh, let's see. Uh, crude futures sixty seven a barrel. Um, 
and bread 72 bear blah 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 okay well okay the okay so, so they say a surprising decrease in crude oil stocks and a reduction in oil stocks sharply anticipated perhaps lending support to royalties report saudi arabia is seeking this they want higher prices look at the economic reform anyway now Aside from the fact that they're doing that, that we're exporting oil 21 million 21 million barrels. Keep in mind that's an entire day of our of our entire oil consumption. But it's not our consumption, obviously we're exporting it. But it's more than an entire day's consumption we're exporting. So that's what like 15 percent roughly, or something like that, of our oil is exported. Um, so it's all nonsense. Now, if we look at the refining, see everything else is the same. We refine the same amount, we distill the same amount, basically. The products are the same, everything else is the same. The big difference here is that we imported 7 million barrels less, or 8 million barrels, sorry, 7, I'm sorry, 7 days, sorry, 5 million barrels less, not, not 10 days. It's 5 million barrels less than last week. That's really the killer, right there is, is the main thing. That plus the fact that we're still exporting an incredible amount of oil. Uh, there's nothing else that's going to happen. So that that's what causes the draw on oil. So, you know, on the whole, though, it's kind of bullish for them. But I think next week there'll be a backlash going the other way. So um, and we're also into the end of the contract period. So right about in, in fact, I said this morning, 6850 was my shorting target. And we just came a little bit under it. So I don't know if anybody caught that, but that was a trade over there. Um, now, we were going to look at some futures. I don't see anything very playable right now. Um, we're, we're kind of over a lot of the numbers I'd want to play at. 68.50 on the NASDAQ is our shorting line. It was great this morning. We went from 68.50 all the way down to 68. And 50 points on the NASDAQ is two is $1,000 per contract gain. And it never stopped out. It just went down and down and down. We, put a stop, we, we lowered our stops, but we never hit them. So that was a nice game this morning. The same thing on, uh, who else do we short? We short the Russell, I forget. I don't know, I think we shorted two things this morning. Let me see. Um, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Keeping an eye, NQ's falling. Nope, oh, I see, that's from earlier. There you go. Oh, the Dow, 24.8 and 68.50. Those are our two shorting lines. So 24.8 on the Dow, let's blow that up a little. Was right here. And right here, actually, even after the open, we hit 24.8. And then we came down. That was a bad, bumpy ride down, though, unfortunately. And we came down to 24 cents, so 100 points there too. So 500 bucks on the Dow, 1,000 bucks on the NASDAQ. But the point is, in the morning, when you see something move up on the futures, you know it's coming on very, very low volume, and it doesn't really mean anything. So it was very likely, and I, and I read the news. So here's the process. I see a big move in the futures going up. I know it's on very thin volume. I look to see if it's justified, and if it's not justified, that's when I start thinking I might want to short it. Um, it wasn't justified because there was really no news at all that was really exciting, okay? And plus, you know, we knew IBM was going down also. Um, that's what the Dow's managing to shake off right now is the big IBM drop. But now that it ran its course, it's not like we want to bet it again. That was our mistake yesterday, which we didn't repeat today, as we tried to double dip on the thing. One time is fine. You know, if I can make 1500 bucks in the morning, I'm done. I don't really need to have a big day after that. All right? So, so you know, don't overplay things. Um, the same goes for oil. I mean, oil had a night, oil had a move down. That that this move down in oil was almost a thousand bucks. So you don't want to overplay that either. But if we get back over 68, at this point, I, I don't mind shorting uh, if they reject 68. Um, Obviously, I wouldn't short silver. I love silver. We have silver wheat and for longs. And uh, gold is lagging at the moment. But we also have some gold miners, so I don't feel the need to play gold. So there's nothing very exciting here to play. Oh, how's coffee doing? Coffee's still cheap. Um, dun, 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 Casey. Well, oh, huh, it popped. Well, <laughs> 
This is not the same contract. This is KCN8, which is what we switch to as KC dries up. So I don't think, um, what's KC, um, JKLM8? No. What's the current coffee contract? <laughs> um, all products, KC. The current one is that expires. Wait, the one expiring is KCM8. So that's the current contract. What happened? KCM8. Ooh, did it expire? That's confusing. I thought they had another day. All right, anyway, so N8, which we picked up at 116, has gone up to 117 already. Oh, look, see? And I had four longs at that, just under 116. And, well, now, if I see, now I had four, so that's a lot. I should take that. I mean, that's 2,000 bucks already. I wish I saw that earlier. Um, I think... Let's let, let's play for 117, see if it holds, I guess. But I kind of, I'm pretty inclined. You know, 2,000, it's like I kind of would like to take 1,000 off the table. Mm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one. I'm going to compromise. I'm going to take one off. And we'll see how that goes. Okay, so we got one off now. So now I've got three. If it goes below 117, I'll go down to two. And but then two, I'm happy to have for the long term because you know I am long term bullish on coffee. I expect a much bigger run. But the way it usually goes, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So you got to take those quick thousand dollars when you can. It's foolish not to, you know. Because if you look at the coffee chart, you know you can have uh, soft any charts like this for the future. That's something you need to know about the futures because you could have. Hello. Why is this thing so slow? Well, that's hard to tell. But you can have dozens and dozens. Here's a channel, let's say, from one, you know, 120 and 116, which is where we buy it. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times to buy it at 116. And most of those. Most of those times we get more than a penny run. A penny, even a penny, those five hundred bucks a contract. But when we get a, you know, so you get a, you get five hundred bucks and five hundred bucks and five hundred bucks and five hundred bucks. That's forty five hundred dollars. You need a nine cent move if you're going to wait. You need a nine cent move to get that. There hasn't been a nine cent move. You can't sit around waiting. This does happen sometimes. Here's a nine cent move right here. This is a nine cent move. That, that does happen sometimes, but if you're not going to trade and only wait for that, then you'll end up just riding out this nonsense. But instead, we get in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out so many times. We make more money than you make on this move that you have to wait months and months for. I'm expecting a huge move in coffee, so I try to always be in some, but I don't play it as if it's i don't play it as if it's never going to go down i always like take a little profit get back in take a little profit get back in i try to leave one or two open but when it does something silly like runs up to 120 i take them both off and i wait for a pullback and if i don't get a pullback i'll get back in at 122 or something like that when it breaks over this line you gotta you gotta play it inside the inside the um Oh, where's my brain? Um, inside the channel, it is currently trading in channel. That's the word. You got to play it in the channel it's trading, and you got to be realistic. This channel is a downtrending channel. Goes top over here and a bottom over here, and there's no violation so far. So you keep playing it in the channel, and you keep adjusting to assume that the channel's heading lower, so 120 is going to be a solid ceiling. Now, I'm hoping it's going to break over 120, over the descending channel, and start forming an up channel. That's when I'll get a little bit more bullish. But right now, we're clearly in a down channel. You can't deny that. So you got to play it the right way. You can't, just, you can't play things hoping for the best because you can end up hoping and waiting for a long time. 
All right. Um, Jow says, your take on MO and BMY sell some puts as they are low in the channel. Uh, we just had a whole conversation about this. We didn't like uh, Crystal Myers. I, I said I didn't particularly like them. Um, their cancer drug that everybody had. Look, they were up because people thought they were going to get bought out. They didn't, they're not getting bought out. They, uh, the main reason they were going to get bought out was they had a blockbuster cancer drug. It turns out Merck's drug is much, much better, doing the same exact thing. Um, so they could not, but aside from not being in great shape, they may actually be in trouble because this cancer drug, I believe, was supposed to be a good 10% of their sales. And it's pretty much all of their growth was pinned on this one thing. So I'm not a big fan of BMY. Um, as of, uh, MO, of course, we just took a position in MO. I think it just was it like yesterday. Anyway, we see we just added an MO position because um, I like them, and I think that eventually, long long term, I think they're going to get into the pot business, which is going to be massively profitable for them. It'll be bad for everybody else who sells pot because they can make it in bulk. They've got the infrastructure in place. They can make it for one tenth the price that people are selling it for now, and they can distribute it profitably. And people are going to say, "Oh, I'll buy you know Cheech and Chong cigarettes or whoever they pay to be branding them, and I'll I'll buy you know I want a pack." And the thing about see here's the thing: there's a lot of brands of cigarettes, right? Again, they're experts at marketing. Well, there's a lot of brands of pot, but they're very inconsistent. Um, in the in the the way they're sold now in pot shops and stuff, um, whereas and people care about this. Like I know pe you know I know people. I used to be one of the people. I know people who smoke a lot of pot though, and there's a big difference between the pot they're going to smoke for the movies and the pot they're going to smoke at a concert and the pot they're going to smoke to go have dinner and the pot they're going to smoke to to uh, to go to a party. You know, it's all different. They, there's a different kind of high. Sometimes you want to be barely high. Sometimes you want to be very high. Uh, it all matters. And consistency would be a huge selling point for Philip Morris. The fact that they say, you know how high you're going to get if you smoke a, you know, a, well, not a camel, but you know what I mean. If you smoke a camel, you know you're going to get stoned. If you smoke a, a Marlboro, you know that you're going to get a, a working high, you know, a like, kind of high that makes you productive at work, you know, whatever. So that's going to be the, the, I can see the whole thing. I mean, I can really clearly in my mind see the entire campaign roll out and how they're going to do it. Um, I, I think that's going to, they're going to just roll up the, <laughs> roll up, <laughs> just roll up the industry. It's going to be over before it even starts for these guys. So. So Ten Twenty says, "How do you know these things?" I used to smoke pot. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. I smoked. I smoked a good amount of pot in college. I I tapered off, and um, I was never. I was never. Well, I was never a pot. I was never like a pothead. But I, my friends all smoked. Everybody smoked back in the '80s. So I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a thing. Um, I was telling my kids. I tell tell my kids this. I'm like, you know, I think it's stupid not to talk to your kids about things like this. Um, but that's me as a parent. But I told my kids, like, we used to sit in Madison Square Garden with thousands of people, and it was completely normal for the person next to you to just hit you with their elbow and pass you a, and hand you a joint. And it wasn't their joint. It came from, like, somewhere much further down the road. So, And you would just take the joint and take a puff and pass it on to the next person. That was perfectly normal behavior. That would happen in Madison Square Garden at an outdoor concert, anywhere. People would just pass joints around, and they did. It was like I don't know. People who had pot were happy to share it with the people who didn't have pot. It was like it was exactly that Woodstock hippie dippy culture thing. Um, and I, I told my kids that my kids were like, ew, somebody else put their mouth on. <laughs> I'm like, that's what, you know, like we didn't care. Nobody worried about that. You didn't worry about somebody spiking it or doing something bad. It was just a thing. It was so, but it was so normal that you would never assume, that, that's the other thing, that you would never assume there was going to be a person in the row that was going to say, oh, no, I think that's terrible. How dare you hand me a joint? There weren't people like that. I mean, I, I don't know where Jeff Sessions went to school, but he wasn't at our school. <laughs> um, in fact, the first time I got high was uh, the Boston concert in Madison Square Garden. I was 13 years old. My parents dropped me off for the concert. Um, 
And it was Boston and Hot Tuna opened. I didn't like Hot Tuna, but they opened, so what can I do? Um, anyway, so we didn't smoke at the time. We were kids, so nobody was handing us joints. But, um, but the garden at the time, since every single person in the garden was basically smoking pot, the garden was full of smoke, which was not a stage effect. It was just some pot smoke filling Madison Square Garden. <laughs> So the whole place was this big smoky room and you're getting this contact high. So we didn't realize it, but I just remember I was like freaking out of the concert. It was so weird. And I thought the effects were like so amazing. It was really because I was stoned, but that was, I didn't know it at the time. So that started me on my road to ruin, I think, when I was 13 years old. And after that, I blamed the uh, massive total availability pot where I live. Like just everybody smokes, so it wasn't even a thing not to. Um, but I, I, I frankly never thought it was a bad thing. I, I, I would so much rather be with high people than drunk people. I mean, a million times more. No question about it. <laughs> so I hope, it, I hope it does come back. I hope it comes back, and I hope it turns into more like what it was when we were in college, which was very nice. Anyway, um, second question, Olga, for the OOP. Um, and, by, oh, by, and by the way, I don't smoke anymore. So in case you're interested, I don't smoke anymore. I couple of times I've had one people handing me a joint or something like that, but since I've had kids, really, you know why? Because when I had a kid, when we had the kids, um, one day I was stoned, and when the, when 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 Madeline, my little one, my, my oldest one, was a baby, and um, something happened, something bad happened. It wasn't too bad, but it was something bad, and I realized like I was not a hundred percent. And I, I, that was literally like the last time I got high, basically, other than a couple of very odd events. Um, and that was 20 years ago. And, and it was because I'm like, I can't be a parent and it be in any way diminished. You know, like just in case my daughter needs me, there was no chance I wanted to be anything less than 100 percent alert and awake and able to do something if she needs help. So that's what that's what actually changed it. Just the, the same thing goes for drinking. I don't I don't get drunk either because I just. I have children. I have responsibilities above above and beyond myself. So that's how come I straightened out. Doesn't mean I don't drink, but I don't get drunk. <laughs> Let's see. For the OLP, should we cover Sun Power? We didn't set a target to cover. Yeah, I, I like I mean Sun Power had a nice move. Um S P W R. I'm glad we weren't covered. Um if they hold nine, I'm okay. I think basically they blasted up from like seven to ten. So that's three dollars. And if you move up three dollars, how much is your retrace going to be? Your retrace is going to be 20% um, of the run. Okay, so 20% of the run is 20% is, um, of three dollars is 60 cents. So a weak retracement is 940 right there. And a strong retracement is. 880 right there so basically all it did today is it pulled back to a strong retracement off the ten dollar line now since 880 held and 880 is a strong retrace of 10 which we haven't even hit yet it indicates the ten dollar line is in play so what we're going to look for now is to hopefully get back over 940 if that looks good and 940 is holding we'll probably be consolidating for a move up over 10. So that's what I'm hoping is happening right now. If not, we'll cover. No biggie. I mean, we, we're already in good shape, so I'm not worried about it. 1020 says, that's me as well. I guess he's talking about the pop thing. Um, it's time to close out the XLF bull call spread. I didn't know we had an XLF bull call spread. When was that? Was that an official one? I'm sorry, I've been away for two weeks, so I'm totally lost on some of these things. Um... Yes, if we have an XLF bull call spread, it probably is. Uh, a, well, let's see how they do it. I don't know. It was a short, if I remember correctly, we had an idea for a short term play on XLF. Ooh, that doesn't look good. What happened? They didn't, they didn't do what I thought. I thought they were going to do better with the bank earnings, but these bank earnings have been pretty subdued, unfortunately. So I have to see what happens. Oh, wait. Trump says the adult film actress is a total con job. Wow, he's ratcheting it up, huh? <laughs> It'll be funny when she shows pictures of his penis on TV. <laughs> All right, 
right, so we'll see what happens. All right, where are we? So, meanwhile, Fuchi's doing nothing, so. Uh, Brendan says we have the 27, 27, 50. When do we do it? That's what I'd like to know. Do you know when, you know when we said that? Was it, in the, it was in a post, wasn't it? Because I certainly didn't see it in chat. Brandon, you know what day it was? Because I, I don't have a good tool to find it at this uh, on this computer. I honestly, I don't think it went in a portfolio. I think it was something I suggested in a morning post, or maybe I forgot to put it in a portfolio. A couple of weeks ago. Oh, so freaking helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> couple of weeks ago. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Well, how about what date, what month is, what month is the spread? Is it this month? Is it April? Oh, we got 68 on oil. Where is that? Oh, look at what happened to coffee. People are selling it. Damn it. Oh, is it done for the day? It's probably done trading for the day. I don't think I can sell it if I want to. Hmm. I don't really want to, though. All right, we'll leave it. At least I got some money off the table. <laughs> It's April, so it expires. Well, it, it expires. I don't think um, XLF was 10 April. Oh, you're saying April 10th is when I said it? That makes sense. Okay. Hang on. We were talking about oil. Oil's just about 68. That's fine. We'll take a look and see what happens there. Now let's go to April 10th and see if we can find this thing. Hopefully Winston is on the ball with his numbers. Let's see. Fifth, wow, sixth, ninth, tenth. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Nope. Nope. Ugh. Is that what you meant? Did you mean April 10th, like the post? The trade date was April 10th. If the trade date was April 10th, how come I can't find it on April 10th? Would it be the day before? Maybe. Maybe you traded on the 10th, but we talked about it on the 9th. Yes, it's worth the earnings. That makes sense. Nope. Damn it. Weird. <clears throat> hmm. April 4th. Okay. Winston apologizes to everybody for all this wasted time. <laughs> now, let's try that. And it's older. April 4th. Okay, here we go. Let's see. This was what? This was Wednesday. I was in Florida. All right, Control F. Ah. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> if you think you need, it's not official trade, guys. If you think you need a bullish hedge, XLF should be fun at twenty-seven sixty-two. The April twenty-seven full call spread is thirty-five and pays fifty if they hold twenty-seven fifty. So yeah, to, they expire on Friday. So and we're and we're right on target, right? So that's what we can get out of it. Um, it's a very clever play. Let me see what happened. Um, ugh. This box really gets in the way sometimes. Okay. It was a good play. It was a good idea. 
We didn't need much of a move. We didn't get much of a move, did we? XLF. And the point was if you needed a bullish play, if you felt you weren't being bullish enough, April 27 is now 52 cents. Oh, yeah, look, you can close it out for 50 cents. Of course, close it out. You can get your 50, you can close it for 50 cents or 49 cents. Why risk it? All right, there's that. So that answers that question. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you have two days to go, you're not going to do better than 50 cents, right? So if you can sell these for 53, 79. Oh, that's a Delta. It looks somebody got 55. If you can sell these guys for 50, uh, 53 cents, and oh, somebody's trying to sell it right now. And if you can, and if you can get for the 2750s, I'm sorry. Mm, and 20, if anyway, if you can get 52 cents here, and you can get three cents there, or even four cents there, you're gonna get 48 cents. That's pretty much all you were gonna get. So it's fine if you can get it. That's all. It's just a quick trade to make some quick money, and we accomplished the. Uh, the mission on that one. So what was the context of that? We were in chat and we were talking about the Dow and at the time NASDAQ was 6,500. 6, we were looking at bounces, I guess. Um, so I said, so as exciting as this recovery is, we're not there yet, though this is a big save and puts us back on a possibly bullish track, but we must clear those strong bounce lines. So this was what, the fourth? So here we are on the fourth. Maybe here, maybe it was here or something like that. I don't know what day it was. Um, so that's what I said. Say so we must clear the bounce lines into the weekend. Then, as I said a week ago, it's really up to earnings. We start in earnest when the big banks report next week. And Friday, we decided they would start out well. So that was our premise. So if you think you need a bullish hedge, in other words, we were thinking we were too bearish considering what was happening in the market. And I said, so if you need a bullish hedge, XLF is fun. And uh, it's easy, easy to come up with something like that. It's 35 cents and pays 50. So you make 42% in 16 days if you make the full price. Um, you can combine it with a short Citibank uh, 65 put. Uh, these are long terms, of course. And uh, three IC. So three short Citibanks pays for 50 of the spreads. So the spreads are free, and you're obligated to buy Citibank to 65 bucks. That's a good play. How Citibank end up? Well, they're, well, they're still above 65 bucks, so it's okay. They're not as good as they were, but they're above 65. Actually, it's, it's only a tiny amount of money. It's 70 to 69. It's only a, a $1 move. It's a weird proportion on that chart. Uh, and it also works for Wells Fargo. How does Wells Fargo do? So, by the way, so when, these, when you're done and you've collected your profit of 50 times 15 cents is... Um, 5,000 times 0.15 is what, um, 750 bucks? Is that it? Yeah. 5,000 times 15 cents. Yeah, 700 is not much, 750 bucks. So when you make your 750 bucks, if you want to close out your uh, short call and be done with it, then be done with it. If you still believe in, if you want to keep it, then keep it. It depends on if it fits in your portfolio. So Wells Fargo 2 is selling off a little bit since we did it. But also, it's a pretty narrow range. It's like down above 50. And what was the Wells Fargo call? Was, um, oh, what's this? Um, and they were the 50 puts. So those are fine. I mean, basically, everything's where we expect it to be. Speaking of daughters, there you go. All right. Let me shut my thing off on the phone here. That's it. Okay. All right, where are we? Um, all right, so anyway, so that was the answer to that question was Sure, close it if you're that close to it because it, it, it can't go, you know, it can't get better, but it could get worse. If it drops five cents, you lose five cents. So, it, is it possible? You know, you know, it's, it's 50 50 whether it goes up or down at five cents or 10 cents in the next couple of days. So, given that you have a, a 50 percent chance of losing uh, a nickel or five or 10 cents, and you can for sure take 
all but two cents of the profit off the table now, there's no point in taking the risk. It doesn't, there's no, there's not enough upside to make the risk worth it. See, always think of that. Always think of what kind of risk you're taking versus a potential reward. Like we talked about yesterday with the um, like we talked about yesterday with the um, uh, with the futures, right? The, the the math we talked about. Let's get up to there. I'll show you what we said because it's very important for futures trading, also. Home. So. Oh, okay. So. Blah 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 blah. Where did I explain it? Uh, here we go. See, very good explanation. At the moment, we're shorting the S&P futures at the 2700 line, but we can't be sure we hit it, so we short. Oh, wait, let me see if I can get a, a thing up. Probably not because um, the problem is, oh, oh, I can't if I do a big one, though. Haha. -ha. I can do a big five-minute one, and we'll see what we're talking about. We'll do a play-by-play. -play. Oh, no, it did go off the thing. You bastards. Hourly? Not really the same thing, though. No, nah, I'm ticked off. All right, and the S and P isn't. Um, shoot. Oh wait, maybe I'll think of a swim though. We can do it. Watch. Figure this out. Futures trader. No. Forex trader. <coughs> Short. I know somewhere I have a big thing. Ah, flexible grid. There it is. Yay. Style. Studies with time frame. Oh, there. No, go away. Time frame. Five days, five minutes. Okay, so yeah, it's a very small move. So here's the twenty seven hundred line right here. Okay, and the, the one we the one we got was this initial one. So what I said I'll go back to that. All right, well, let's try to keep it all in our heads because it's hard to go back and forth, unfortunately. Um, boom. Nope, there. Okay, so we short one X at 26.975, another at 26.9850, and then at 26.9950, we should short two more, and we're at 26.9875. We stop out at 27.025 of the loss, which would be $75 per contract, 4x then we wait for a cross below 2700 to short again with tight stops so given that here's what happened that was obviously before the market opened like at 8 30 or so um so given those instructions and it's well okay it doesn't matter what where we started so we expected it to go up and that's around here we were looking for it to test 2700 which I know it's hard to see, but it, it exactly did that. So it, it didn't go over, and it did exactly what we thought. So here, where we started was here, and we short. So we, there was, it was around here at eight thirty when we were talking about it. So I said, "Here, we want a short one here, and if it goes straight down, fine, that's nice. But if it doesn't and it goes up, we add another one here, and we add another two over here, just this testing the line. And then as long as it doesn't go over the line, here's the line doesn't go over." We write it down, and then we wait. And our goal was uh, our goal was uh, 92, and we actually hit 92.33. Okay, so I don't I I, I mean <laughs> I don't know what I could do more than that. 
Because <laughs> I said, here, look, what we have so far is a low volume rally, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So how's the 5% rule works? We ran up from 2660 to 26 um, to 2700. That's 40 points. And our 5% rule says we can expect 20% of the run retrace back to 2692. That's what we expect. Now, please don't get hung up. Some people get really hung up on the exact number. I made this freaking rule up, okay? <laughs> it's my rule. I made it up. I invented this rule, okay? It's not from God. It's not, it wasn't written on tablets and handed to me 2,000 years ago or anything like that. This is my rule. And I'm telling you now, it's not that accurate, okay? So you can't take it as gospel. It has to hit 92. The point is that was the range we were looking for. So it came down close. We ended up getting out of $300 a contract, a little shy of what we hoped for, but still very nice. And the best part is, though, because we followed this plan, we had four contracts short at the highest possible price. So we had four contracts short at uh, $26.98.75. And at 375, we end up making five bucks per contract. I mean, I'm sorry, we end up making five points per contract. So it was actually two, actually it was 250 on the SP doing it that way. So as it worked out, we made a thousand dollars on four contracts doing it that way. So it's perfect. Um, it wasn't our total goal, but it was fine. Where are we now? So uh, back to the thing. So then on four, now we did it later. But because we did it at, when we when we went back in again, we did it right at the twenty seven hundred line, and we risked the seventy five dollar loss. But we only had one contract, so we actually lost seventy five after gaining a thousand. Because the second time didn't work, and then we just said the hell with it. And then at the end of the day, I I got fancy and shorted, and I left it overnight. I thought it was going to be a good thing, but I blew it, and I actually lost money here. But then I made it up in the morning, doing the same thing we did yesterday. Because in the morning today, we had the same nonsense. It was up. And it started coming down, and now it's back up again. And now I'm tempted to short it again, but I got to stop myself from doing that. But that's it. It's very simple. I mean, you just have to have the discipline to make. You see, the the main point is make sure that you know what your risk is. We were risking seventy five dollars a contract, and the potential reward was four hundred dollars per contract. Our risk was 75. Our reward was realistically 300, around 300 a contract was going to be our best shot. Um, you have to know that, and that way, as long as your reward outweighs your risk by a large margin, you don't have to be right that often to make money. But you've got to be disciplined and take the losses when they're losses. You can't say, you can't start crossing your fingers and hoping it changes and so on and so forth. Then you gamble. We had a very solid premise. That when the market opened, the heaviest selling would wipe out the bullshit futures gains. But after that, then the market would just do whatever it wanted to do. The thing is that the futures had gone up too, had taken the market up too far to be easily sustainable. And that's what we played on. So you're welcome. Brendan says that was a perfect setup. Um, LB got away to the downside. I didn't get a fill on the short call. But did fill the long. Should I wait for recovery to fill the current price? I have several trades at this situation as a general rule of thumb. Todd's asking that. Well, Todd, I haven't gotten around to adjusting yet. Um, LB at 45. I don't know where LB is now. LB is also a long turnaround play. Wow, 36. You did nothing all the way down to 36? That's not cool. No, at this point, I would certainly do something. Um, you didn't get a fill on the short call, but you did fill long. Well, what long, what price would be the helpful information so we know what's going on? Um, what did you pay for the what, – what calls do you have and what did you pay for them? That's my question. And how many? <laughs> it's just a – Instead of going back and forth 20 times. Anyhow, that brings us back to portfolios then, I guess. All right, because it's like, yeah, it's an hour in. We only got an hour left. All right, portfolios. Mm -mm. The long-term portfolio, I don't actually remember where we were last time. I think we were more like 10% last time, maybe not even. Um, let me just refresh this and see if we go to the thing. 
And of course it changes hour to hour, but uh, or whatever. Um, but what I like about all these, now I, I was away for two weeks, don't forget, okay? I was away for, um, when did I leave? Oh, on my birthday, that's when I left. March 29th I left. And I just got back on the 13th. So I was, away for a week, I was away for two weeks. And the portfolios we did, the last review was obviously expiration week was here. So what happened is basically I, was, I knew I was going away. So I didn't want to make a lot of trades. Because, you know, who knew? And the market was being weird anyway. So we really didn't make many trades here. And then when I was away, we basically made no trades at all. So we had basically done nothing for a month. So that's that's the short story. We did nothing for a month, but a month ago. But in that month, the short term, the long term portfolio. Um, oh, let me see. I'll pull, uh, let me hang on. I gotta do C. I gotta do this over here on the other computer. Hang on a second. So I don't know where I put all the reviews. R E V. That's something I should have done before I went away. Is, is compile the reviews. So hopefully this will help me find them. Wow, we say review a lot. Much more than you would think. Holy cow. I would not think that word would come up that often. I mean, outside of saying review. All right, long term portfolio review. So it was on 314. And at the time, the LTP was. Oh, I take it back. We were still at the same price. It was at 17%. So we actually dropped 1% since then. All right. I thought it was lower. I guess, I guess it had gone lower and then recovered. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It had gone lower after that period. But um, but then it got then it came back. The options opportunity portfolio was at now that one was sucking the the OOP was at ninety six thousand four seventy three, and now and again we haven't touched it. It's the exact same positions. They're at now twelve point four percent. So that's um that's a huge change. 112,433. So they have gained um, about $16,000 in a month. So these are some nice positions. So the long term portfolio basically flat, but it had already had nice gains. I mean, up 16% up for the year in the first quarter is very nice. The options opportunity portfolio blasted higher this month. Like all these trades finally came together, which is kind of what happens with this strategy because when, when we're selling a lot of premium, it doesn't look good at first. It's mostly all about setting up positions to make money down the road. But then when, when, when things start moving and when, the, and when the, uh, you start getting towards your target prices and the time begins to erode all the premium you sold, all of a sudden these things really take off. And so that's what happened here. So we, we had phenomenal performance in the options opportunity portfolio. The butterfly portfolio was pretty much at zero and it's at 7.6% now. So that had a nice gain too. Mostly because we added Disney. That was an entire addition to the Butterfly portfolio. And uh, oh, and OIH came back nicely as well. That had a nice month. Um, the Money Talk portfolio is right about where it was at 70%, about the same. But the, now the Money Talk portfolio is self hedging, though, of course. We, we added this big uh, SQQ position. Um, what else do we have? And um, the short term portfolio. Now, here's the thing, though. The short-term portfolio is up 80%, and that's the pair to the long-term portfolio. So it's the combined – all right, well, wait, hang on. Let me find the short-term portfolio first so I can be sure. The combined amount of the short-term and long-term portfolio is stunning. Money to our short-term portfolio. Yeah, the short-term portfolio is only 140 last month. We did that review on the 13th, and it was at 130, and now it's at 180. So we gained fifty thousand dollars on the short-term portfolio. Um, 
Ah, sorry, wait a minute. Not that, not fifty thousand. It's gonna be less than that because somehow it's not counting Netflix here. So there'll be about uh, ten thousand less, maybe forty thousand dollars in the uh, short-term portfolio. Because for some reason it's not counting the Netflix. Uh, I don't know why it's zeroed it out. It's still an active uh, contract. Hmm. Oh no, I see why. It was the April sixth. I accidentally sold the April six calls. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I didn't realize it did that. NFLX. They expired worthless. Isn't that funny? April. Yep, look where they were. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, I thought I, I thought I had the later April calls. So um so those expired worthless and they were up hundred percent and then Netflix has since gone up, but it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, the point is this thing is up 80% in, this is in the same time frame as the long-term portfolio. So it's actually way outperforming the long-term portfolio, but that's because we're constantly making those, those day-to-day -day, week to week adjustments in not day-to-day, -day, but you know, we make a lot more adjustments in the short-term portfolio. We try to play the channel of the market. So we get into things, we get out of things. The best thing we did was we, um, with DXD, we had 200 of these spreads. And what we did was we first, we bought back the calls when DXD was low. And then when DXD went up, we sold the calls. So we made we made a nice chunk of change playing the, playing the spread as we should. And we still have protection all the way into July, which is great. So we still, we're still well protected. DXD is at eight. So I don't know why these things are so cheap. This is a really cheap spread still. Um, SQQ2, we also played the played around with SQQ. In fact, we have these 50 short, we 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 had the long 1620 spread. We bought back the we we sold the 16s, cashed out of those, and now we have the 15s that I'm sorry, the 20s that are covered by this spread. And this spread, really. We have two spreads that are covering it. So, you know, we did you know, I, you know, we played them perfectly. That's why we made so much money because we actually timed it incredibly well. Um, you know, we have the hedges to protect us from a catastrophe, but when there's not a catastrophe, we're if we see that we're in a channel like the S and P has been locked in, right for for ages. So when we see that we're trading in this channel like this, and it's a big wide channel too, we're free to use that channel to our advantage. So we sell, we, we buy back our short, you know, for the short positions, for the ultra shorts, we buy back the call is here. And when it gets up here, we went, um, mm -hmm. when, when it's high, we buy back the short callers that make, because the ultras go down and then, well, let me just get a chart of the stupid thing. So <laughs> it's too confusing, right? S Q Q Q. All right. Here you go. So when SQQQ is low, or as it was in March, in fact, this is when we bought back the short calls. And then when it went up to 20, which was our goal, don't forget, we, we had the 20, we had the, we originally had the 16, 20 spread. So when we were down below 16, we bought back the 20 calls. And when it went up to 20, we sold the 16 calls that we had. Sorry, when it was down to 60, say that right? When it was down below 16, we bought back the short 20s that we sold in the spread. Then when it went up to 20, we sold the 16 calls that we had. And then and then we go back the other way. We did with DXT going the other way. That's how you play these things. We see a channel and we don't have to, like, look, the first time we didn't do that, but the second time we're in the same channel, we say, hmm, haven't I seen this pattern before? And, and it's not just a pattern, though. Please, I'm not a chart person at all. In fact, <laughs> somebody I'm seeking out for said something about um, uh, what do you? He was, he, oh, I know because I, I said triangle squeezy thingy, which I always say about these 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 wedge patterns. And he said that's not what it's called. It's called this. Like he's some chart expert, and he's like, oh, it's called this and that pattern. And he uh, and he and he's like, uh, ha ha ha! I know more about uh, TA than you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't take TA. It's uh, when my college elective was, uh, you know, when I had to fill my college elective in stupid, superstitious bullshit, I took tea leave reading instead. 
<laughs> that's how I, I honestly, that's how I feel about, about TA. It's just such nonsense. Um, the 5% rule is not TA, it's just math. It's just that we illustrate it by showing you the TA that follows the 5% rule. And, and we don't need more TA because so many people follow it, it becomes a fundamental factor. But it, it, only for that reason. In other words, like if everybody, if everybody bought IBM on a, on a blue moon Tuesday when the, when, you know, when the, something else happens, when the, you know, when the sun rises in the east, you know, some other factor, then I, then I write it on my calendar and say, whenever this happens, make sure you buy IBM ahead of time. But instead of waiting for the stupid chart to be drawn, I say, well, this always happens when that happens. So I'm going to do it ahead of the game. You don't need charts to tell you that. The trick is to know when. The trick is to know what the chart's going to look like before it looks like it. That's how you get ahead of these people, and you make a huge amount of money doing that, which is what we did with our with our uh, ins and outs on the short term portfolio. So anyway, bottom line, huge money, barely touched it. That's the key. Did re literally made. I'd say if we made four changes all month. That's a lot to all to all five portfolios. And yet we've had our most productive month so far by not touching anything. Huge gains across the board. You know, the long-term and short-term portfolio or a paired portfolio, um, so one's up $80,000 and one's up like $75,000. So they're up $150,000 on a $600,000 start. So that's 25%. So combined, they're up 25% and it's not even four months yet. You know, I mean, honestly, the, you know, when you do this good, you should really consider cashing out. <laughs> you know, because like, you're not going to keep it up. We're not going to we're not going to finish the year up 100 percent. So there will be diminishing returns. Um, I wish I had the confidence to say, yeah, we'll make 25 percent every quarter. But that's silly. You know, it's silly. You know, it's not very likely. So, you, you know, when you're that far ahead of the curve, you have as much chance of harming yourself as hurting yourself. In fact, um, we did the, on Monday, we did the, um, and you guys should really, when you see reviews, you got to really drill into them. I mean, if you want to learn how to do this stuff, the reviews are the key. And we have all the reviews are in, um, in the virtual portfolio section. We have all of our reviews are in there. All the ones I remembered to put in there anyway. Um, but when we did the top trade review, the funny thing about the top trade review is we we had a um, 81.25 winning percentage going into, uh, you know, go, this is for the first uh, um, uh, turnaround by September. Wait. Okay. So, uh, I'm confused. July. No, for the first half of the year of last year, because we, it takes us, you know, we're about six months behind in reviewing things. Um, we're not behind. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to review a trade a month after you started. So somewhere around six six to nine months, we'll do our reviews. Um, so our last review, which went through July, we had 32 out of um, – we had 24 winners in 32 trades, eight losers. Oh, but then, then it turned around, so it became 26 and six, and because two of the losers turned into winners. And we had 81.25% winning percentage. So – this week, or this not this week, in August, the first month of the second half, when we do the review, we had three out of four winners. And you would think that's good, but three out of four is only 75%. It actually brought down our average. Having just one losing trade brings down our average. You know that so that's the point I'm making about the portfolios. When you're doing this well, when you're when you're running at a hundred percent return rate for the year. You're not, you know, anything you do worse, if I, if I make 20% next quarter, that's going to bring my average down. If we, if we are flat, it, it cuts my average in half. So it's really annoying. <laughs> so the thing is, you know, it, it's, there's more harm than good likely going ahead. Now, of course, obviously it's my job to be here and do the portfolio, so I'm going to do them. But, but seriously, when you make that kind of money, when you make 20 something percent, in four months and your goal is to make 20 percent for the year we put six hundred thousand to work in the long and short term portfolios right now main portfolios and we made one hundred and fifty thousand dollars already 155 actually it's 25 percent of our money back our goal is to make 20 percent for the year 
There is literally no reason not to cash it in and take an eight month vacation. Okay, there's there's profit in in free time too. There's profit in doing other things with your life. It, it's nice to look back at all these years. You know, I just turned fifty five, so I'm very philosophical about this right now. It's nice to look back at all these years you worked and say, oh, I made so much money that year, blah 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 blah. But honestly, I mean, nothing beats. The, the, the three week vacation I took to Europe with the kids when they were younger and doing stuff like that, or when we went to Japan, you know, I mean, those big long vacations where you really do something different with your life for a while and you, and you go on adventures, that's what it's all about. That's what I'm working for, you know? So, so like if, you, if you're doing really well, just consider you don't have to keep going. You don't have, you know, if you if you hit your goals for the year early, maybe you don't have to take the whole rest of the year off, but maybe just take some time off. Go relax. Enjoy yourself. You know, take some pottery classes or something. I don't know. Whatever, whatever kind of thing you like to do. Smoke some pot. It's legal. Go to go to states where you can smoke pot. Um, it's just, you know, it's just not. The chance of doing this well consistently, I mean, you know, going forward when you're doing double, at least, you know, I mean, at best we expect to do 40% and we're double that. So at least in the very least, I could take a quarter off and not even think twice about it. If I took a quarter off and for the next two quarters, we only make 10%. We're still hitting the top range of our goal for the year at 40%. Or I could take lots of long weekends, you know, whatever. But the point being, Think about that, okay? Like, if you're doing really well, the chances are not that good, especially in the market. It's not a roulette wheel. The chances are not that good that you're going to keep doing really well because at a certain point, the economy runs out of money to give you. We can't all make 25% a quarter. It's not Zimbabwe. You know, the only thing the, the only that happens is if there's hyperinflation. It's not hyperinflation, and that means this money that you're getting is being taken from somewhere else. And, and that means that eventually it's gonna run out. They can't just keep giving you money. It'd be nice, but it doesn't work that way. All right, so let's get back to work. What's going on with you guys? Okay, LB position, right, we're back to Todd now with the LB. He has two 35 calls at 10.30 and some 35 puts at 570. So LB, he has two 35 calls at 1030. So let's take a look at LB and see what we can tell him about that. LB, I see these are 2020. Though I forgot to tell him what year, isn't that silly me? See, I got to tell him everything. I got to be so specific because nobody knows how we uh, talk about trades, I guess. So not like we ever do it. So, you know, who can tell? Okay, so I hope it's 2020 anyway. So he's $35 calls, which you're now. What? No, that's XLF. That's, I'm like, that can't possibly be right. Okay, now now we're back into like a reality here. All right, the thirty-five. I was like, I was like, sorry, man, you lost everything. Um, they're six forty. Okay, so LB is now at thirty-six forty. You, you, I mean, but you look, you didn't be the house, right? You didn't sell premium. You bought a lot of premium. So the puts at least, and they were five seventy. Now they're seven. There's no problem with the puts. That's still a good target. But what I would do is I would take your your 235 calls. They're 650, let's say. Or, yeah, they can't be 670. That's silly. Um, anyway, so all right, whatever they are, 670. So let's say they're um, 1300 bucks. Um, I would roll them down to the $30 calls at 910. 910 is the last sale. So I would do four of those. So you're collecting thirteen hundred. If you do four of these, it's thirty six hundred bucks. So you're two thousand dollars short. Okay. Then I would sell 
five of the 4250 calls, which is four bucks. So you can collect 1600 bucks there. So net, you're only putting out like 400 more dollars. Okay, because roughly, I'm going to do this in my head, but you're net putting out only about 400 more dollars. And you're going to end up with the 30 4250 bull call spread with the short $35 puts and four of them. So you're into a, um, a $5,000 spread for what I believe is going to be um, maybe about 2,500 bucks. All right, so that, that would be the way I would fix that. Oh, the beige book, right. forgot about the beige book. Uh, apparently, it's not so bad, but it's not so good either because the, the market's kind of flat. Um, I'll take a look in a minute. Would you buy back the short DXD now and wait to write again? Um, no, because because we're, we're bubbled the 50-day moving averages, so technically everything's kind of bullish. So um, I don't have a, I don't have a reason to be sure. We got to I mean I believe earnings are not going to be that good, but I'm, I don't want to overcommit uh, to anything. All right. Although although on the DSD I'll take a look specifically because we want to talk about whether or not that particular one is worth it, or there may be the SQQ and wait to do it again. So, he's, so Brendan's just basically asking, do we want to get more aggressively short now? It's not just about that's why I was talking about. I'm sorry, I lost my I lost my train of thought when I was doing that. It's not just that TA is bullshit. It's that TA is bullshit. The reason I was saying that is because it matters in that it's part, it's when I'm looking at where we, what we're going to do with a position. Yes, I look at where we are on the channel, but I also have to think about what's actually happening now and in the next couple of weeks. So unless I feel there's a strong reason I should be, I should be unhinging my, my position, I'm going to stick with it. So Currently, if anything, we're we're betting we're not going to go that high because we still have these fifty short guys. Um, if I was going to get more bullet, more bearish, I would buy these back, and I think we might do that. That's actually a good idea. We should probably close these out because they're not going to do as much. We can only make twenty eight more cents on them. So for thirteen seventy five, I would rather it's a cheap, for thirteen seventy five. It's a cheap way to increase the power of this spread instead of buying these back for six thousand dollars, right? So I'm all, I'm only half covered anyway. So instead of buying these back for six thousand dollars, I should buy these back for thirteen seventy five, and that means these forty of these are completely uncovered and have plenty of room to run if, if we have a disaster. Now, if we don't have a disaster, I'm going to sell more short-term calls, but we'll cross that bridge later. So the, the key move now would be to, to buy back these SQQs. Since I bought back those SQQs, I don't see the reason I should spend $2,000 more to buy the DXDs when I still got the whole of the spread to make. Because this spread isn't worth much. It's $4,500 on a $20,000 spread. So I'll leave that. It's a tight spread. It's not going to change very much uh, unless, obviously, if the XD pops up. What else is in the short-term portfolio? Now, all these short puts, these are the offsets. So look how much money we, we, we sold. 8, 10, 11, um, uh, 17, 20, I'm rounding, 22, 32, 3742. So we sold $42,000 worth of puts. $42,000 worth of puts to finance the hedges that we bought. Because that's what we keep doing, right? We, where's Whirlpool? I thought we had Whirlpool in here. I'm confused. Wait. Yes, QQ. I, I could have sworn we did a Whirlpool. Oh, there it is. What am I doing? Ha ha. Okay, that's the newest one. Oh no, I had it sent you twice. Ha ha, that's a mistake. I got double we got double entered. Um so so not forty two thousand, thirty seven thousand dollars. So we sold thirty seven thousand dollars worth of short puts to finance the hedges. Now, had the market gone way up and we lost all the money on the hedges, then we would make all the money, on, in theory, we would make all the money on the short puts. As it stands, we've made not that much. We only made three, zero, those cancel out, 
uh, four minus two, let's say 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. So of the 37,000, we're only up 10%. So again, that means that if we spend $30,000 on hedges and they get wiped out because the market rallies up, we're going to recoup that money on the short puts. That's why this portfolio works so well. It's very well balanced. So it's got tremendous protection for the long-term positions, but should the market keep going up, we've hedged the hedges with the short puts. And they're all ones we want to buy. Now, if we have a catastrophic failure, and there's none here, but let's say we end up being forced to buy 500 shares of IBM at 140 bucks. So we don't buy it in the short-term portfolio. What we do then is we would close this and take the loss in the short-term portfolio, and the loss is uh, 1500 bucks at the moment, but let's say the loss was $15,000, it doesn't really matter. Then we would transfer the puts to the long-term portfolio and then add bull call spread or whatever to the long-term portfolio. So a, a losing put in the short-term portfolio becomes a long-term position that we then work on, but none of that has been an issue so far. All right, anyway, so that's the short-term portfolio fully reviewed, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the butterfly portfolio, did we look at that one? That only has two trades in it, so that's easy. We have the Disney trade and the OIH trade. We're going to cover OIH. Um, once we decide the oil run is over, we'll cover OIH. I'm not there yet. Oh, what's the oil doing at the moment? Oil. Oil. Oh, coming near our six. All right, close enough. Sixty-eight thirty-one. This is the same concept as the other one. We're gonna we're gonna assume that sixty-eight fifty is rejected, but I'm gonna start now because it's close. So sixty-eight thirty. If we had another one at sixty-eight forty, that'll give us a sixty-eight thirty-five average, right? In fact, I'll put that in because I'm not gonna be looking. So if I hear the bell ring, that'll be that thing filling. That would give us two at sixty-eight thirty-five, and then as it gets closer to sixty-eight fifty. I would want to do another two maybe, and that'll bring our average up over 68.40. And then we're just gonna wait for the pullback. The pullback we expect, we have a $1 run. So we expect 20% of the, of the run to be rejected. So that's 20 cents. So we expect the pullback to 68.30. Oh, there it goes, wow. And the NYMEX closes very shortly, so I'm going to, I'm not even going to stop out because the NYMEX closes and they're jamming it up into the close to get a good print because they've, they've been flooding with this story of like how, how powerful oil is right now, and they just got a good inventory report, so they're trying to pull out all the stops to get it higher. So I want to add another one as close up in this range up here if I can. But again, NYMEX closes 235. So there's going to be a lot of people buying and, and trying to push the contract price up, especially if we're near expiration. This is their, before they have to sell all their contracts, they want to run the price up as much as they can because they don't, they don't actually want all these open contracts. So I re, ah, oh man, I really want to sell two more. I'm not happy. I want it higher. I don't want it lower. Well, that's not cool. Oh, come on. I'm very upset that it's going the way I thought. I, it's good. I'm very upset that it's making me money. All right, so 35. So if I do 45. Oh, man, cut that out. Ah. Now, nah, here's an interesting point. It gets low enough to the point where I no longer want it if it goes higher. Because I'm like, no, 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 I don't mind if it goes up five cents from here, but I do mind if it goes up 15 cents from down there. That's a sign of strength. Going up five cents from here isn't a sign of strength. Going up 15 cents from down there is more of a kind of is more of a sign of strength. So I'm not as keen to add once it gets all the way back up here again. But I still want to add it like 45 if I can. Well, let me see. I'm at 68.35. I want to get to 68.40. If I add one, it's not going to do it. If I add one here, it's not going to bring it up enough. Is it? 
6840. No, I'd have to add a 6850. If I want to do one, I'd have to add it 6850 to get my average up to 6845. And I don't think they're going to make 6850. Oh, hmm. <laughs> Come on, guys, you can do it. Got five more minutes, ten more minutes. What do you think? All right, let's put it in 49. Let's see, I dare you to fill it. All right, now we can move on. Oh, yeah, the beige broker. Look at that. Phil, the short term portfolio summary says you've used 232,000 more margin than you have available. The same excess margin is in the LTP. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's way more than that because we have we have a combined 600,000. So we have $1.2 million worth of margin at least. That's just ordinary margin. So, yeah, it's well within the bounds. It's just that because we broke the two portfolios up in the, in the uh, thing that you don't see, it doesn't show like the overall broker margin. That's not the way that, um, that option, whatever the hell it's called. Um, I forget. Hang on. It's right there. Power options. That's not the way power options does it. They, they don't, they don't like breach your portfolios over a single account like a regular broker would. So that's the difference. So let's see. In the short-term portfolio, it just gives you this treats everything like it's an IRA, in fact. Um, short term. It doesn't and of course, obviously, you would have a portfolio margin would cut this down tremendously also. Which obviously if you have a hundred thousand dollars to trade, you've got portfolio margin. So that's a big difference also. Most of the buying or well, the buying power is mostly because of all these short puts. Because really, we're not using much else. These naked uh, SQQ calls are also a killer for margin. You know, cash-wise, we're not even using any cash. We have, we have more cash than the portfolio is worth. So that's kind of funny. But in the long-term portfolio, we got, um, yeah, see, we're using 700000 here. We have a million dollars, obviously, of margin. Um, this this shows us if we have a half million dollars of margins, it's treating it like an IRA, and that's the other thing. It, it completely hits you for puts and all that stuff. Well, if you have an ordinary portfolio margin, I know this because we mirror a lot of the stuff in the hedge fund. We're we're using not even ten percent of our margin, you know, on the same trades. Not the same, but similar similar trades. Um, where was I? So that was the butterfly portfolio. The money tour portfolio, I haven't been on money talk. So last time I was on money talk was like, uh, I don't even remember. Well, actually I could tell you, so here it is. We were on 118, was the last time we made a trade. So we haven't been on money talk since, since January 18th. So it's completely untouched for the quarter. And, um, and these guys are doing fine. We're self hedging with the SQQ Septembers. And again, knowing that I can't change it, like I can't make this see the, the I could have in a reg, if this was one of our managed portfolios, I could have ripped it. I could have played the same game with the SQQs, but I can't. It doesn't work that way. I'm only on a, that show once a quarter. So I'll probably be on this month or next either either end of this month or early next month. So I'll probably be on again, but I can't make day trading kind of things with the money talk portfolio. When you make those trades, I have to be able to alert people to make the change. So we just leave them. This is just this is a pure and simple hedge. So the goal here is we damn well better make a lot more money than we're going to lose on this, because we're we're probably going to lose that hedge completely. Um, the options opportunity portfolio. I know there's a lot of guys from that portfolio here. So let's take a look. We have um, short Apple puts. That's I couldn't even be less could not possibly be less worried about something. Um, we have a China Telecom, which I love, so I'm not worried about that one. We have Frontier, who have come back nicely and turned into a winner. We have Barrett Gold, also Gold Gold will come back, and they're actually back to profits. Um, Alaska Airlines, uh, <laughs> apparently they suck, but um, 
<laughs> oh, oil's going up. All right, so 68.40. So now to get... Um, Oh, no, that was my goal. 68.40 was my goal. So I'm good. Again, don't forget, we expect the pullback to 68.30. We expect a 20-cent pullback. So this, at this point, I'm going to cut back to 2, and it will raise my average. But I'm hope, hopefully it won't go over 68.50, and there it goes. But again, like I said, I'm not going to stop out because this is the, um, this is the close of the NYMEX. So this is a lot of... Quick, desperate trading going on here. So there's, it's not. It's. It, I really wouldn't put much stock in it. I'm happy we just got rejected at 68.50. It did spike over, but it didn't stay. And hopefully that doesn't. Hopefully we stay under 68.50 for the close, which would probably be disappointing to them. Now we're just looking at oil. We should look at Brent while we're doing that. So, shoot. BZ. And there it's 73.50. That's good when they're both at resistance points like that. And RB is gasoline at 207. And then we'll look at the dollar, see how that's doing. Dollar's flat, so no effect of the dollar. Gasoline 207 and Brent at 7350, also very tempting short, but playing oil, so it's basically the same thing. So we're exactly five. These guys are basically mirroring each other with five dot with uh, West Texas five dollars below Brent. So if Brent's not over 7350 and he's not over 6850, that looks like a good short to me, right? And you just get out of the especially if they both get over, that's a good sign to get out. And again, my loss is going to be maybe a couple hundred bucks if I got out if they go over versus the reward potential of easily 1,500 bucks. I mean, so you've got 10 times more reward potential than you're risking. That's the way you want to set up your trades. Don't need much of a pullback. If you look at the bigger run here, it's all the way down to 65.80. So you're looking at like a 250 run. Two two fifty is twenty five hundred dollars per contract. I'm not even asking for that. I only throw with like a, you know I only throw with a few hundred bucks. <laughs> but if we get a big pullback, this thing is going to look wonderful. This this is the most important thing right now. Is this clock when the NYMEX stops trading? Now. It doesn't mean it's going to immediately go down because there's going to be no volume when IMAX stops trading. So it's possible that as it stops trading, somebody's going to punch it up and punch it up and punch it up. That's why I want to maintain a little bit of buying power because they can still push it. But I think anything over 68.50 is bullshit, and I'm willing to stick with the trade. Now, the, the conservative thing to do would be to take – uh, one off the table at 68.40. That leaves me with two at 68.40, which makes it less damaging if it goes against me, and I can add again. Okay, I'm not, I only want to have four short, so I don't have a lot of flexibility right now to add. But if, we, if I cut it down to two, my flexibility increases dramatically. So if I get out now at 68.40, I'll be even on two contracts at the higher strike at 68.40. We started, what, like 36 or something like that. That's what you want to do. You want to sort of like work on it and raise your basis and keep, if you're shorting, you want to raise your basis and get it to a better price. All right, 33. Oh, let's go. Okay, I'll watch it for a minute. A little boring, but we'll do it. So got about one minute and thirty some twenty seconds left, ten seconds left. And look at the contract amounts, by the way. So you can kind of see where it's going. You got forty sellers here, twenty buyers, sixty and eight, thirty 
50, 16. So you see the buy, the, the sell is whittling away the buyers. These guys are trying to push the price up. 87, that's a lot. So in other words, when they finally flush these, these sellers, they uncovered a whole other bunch of sellers above them. So there's a lot of people selling here. It's going to be very expensive to try to push through 68.50. And then the question is, do they really have that kind of conviction to do it? So that's a very, very expensive way to get oil's price up. But of course, you have to look at the bigger picture. These guys have 80,000, 60, 70,000 open contracts. So if they buy another thousand contracts and get the price up a dollar, that that the, the profit is on 70,000 contracts, which would be $700,000. So if they spend a um, thousand contracts, thousand down. So they spend a million dollars to move a thousand contracts up a dollar. If they spend a million bucks there of money to do that, they gaining on the other end 70 times more. They're gaining $70 million on the barrels on the contracts they already have. So of course it's worth it for the traders to bid the price up into the close and create a um a, a somewhat of a frenzy for people to buy oil, especially when they on this so they take advantage of a day when they can float a story that makes it seem like everything is going their way for the bulls. And what they hope to do is in, is induce a lot of people to come off the sidelines with bullish bets. And then and then they'll of course sell. And that's what we take advantage of. We know what's going to happen. We know they're going to sell. You know, especially into Friday, because Friday is the contract rollover. So at some point, I'm expecting a 50 cent drop. And 50 cent drops pay 500 bucks a contract. So like I said, coming into this time, which is we just hit 430, now it's, 4, now it's 236, so the NYMEX is closed. And we've got much lighter trading now, so they're going to push it up a little bit higher. And I'm not keen to add another one short unless we have something significant like 60. Because if I go to if I go in one at 60, it'll raise all my prices by a nickel. It'll raise all, it'll raise my average to about 45. So that's worth it to me. I don't. I would like to raise it a nickel if I can. But I'm not. Other than that, I'm not that interested. So we'll see what happens. When do you look at the when do you look to close CL now that you've entered? Well, like I said, I at this point now, because the thing's closing, I kind of would I'm gonna have to stick it out with a bit of conviction right now. Cause I, I think that this is all bullshit. And that means that it might not wash out until after natural gas inventories tomorrow at eleven, but I think somewhere between now and Friday, because of the uh, overhang of contracts at the NYMEX that they have to roll out. Uh, they'll create some selling pressure and we can pick up 50 cents. So my goal is basically to get back down to 68 and then and, and certainly lighten up there. But even if we get back to 40 now, I'll probably drop to two contracts. Because why should I why should I sleep overnight with three open contracts when I can sleep with two open contracts at a nice high price? So that way it's a lot cheaper. If I have to double down, it doesn't cost me as much. All right, so where were we? Okay, <clears throat> this is all the, we don't have time to do both portfolios, so the, this will be the one. But I mean, this is not too dissimilar from the long-term portfolio in many of the trades. So Alaskan Airlines, like I said, crappy airline, but makes money. Best Buy just uh, caught a bid today, although, you know, slow off the gun. But, you know, we're you know, talking two-year trades, so I'm not too worried about it. What I'm happy is they hold our put line. If they're holding our put line, we're fine, because this trade didn't cost as much. Um, 64 minus 35 is like 3, minus 14 is like, you know, sixteen seventeen hundred dollars $1,700 spread. So, this is, so as long as they're over $1,750, that's the end of it. It's a sixteen hundred dollars spread. It's, it's not even a blip on our portfolio. Uh, CBI also not doing well so far, which I'm very surprised. But we'll wait and see how they go. Uh, Cordelines, the gold miner, doing better than ABX. Um, CG, CG, that Colgate. Um, they're they're slow off the gun and not not particularly exciting looking, but they're okay. 
Um, Chesapeake oil disaster, but not, I mean, really not costing us much, but it's a disaster. Um, I haven't had, I, I, I'm not at the point yet where I want to let go of them, but uh, they, they're pushing it. <laughs> if, I, if I was going to purge something, that'd be one of them. Um, Ford, doing good, but you know, I didn't like the bad numbers in China, so I got to see. Uh, well, and the trade war, I'm not sure, is going to be favorable to them because it's, it's they're big overseas sellers. Much more so than GM. Ford has huge amounts of overseas sales. So I'm a little bit worried about, um, about getting into a trade war with those guys. FNSR, I think, is a great deal down here. Um, we just have to see how it goes out. GE, uh, possibly the greatest opportunity in the last few years for buying a stock that's ridiculously underpriced. That's my opinion. I know a lot. Obviously, most people disagree with me. Um, you know, it's a, it's a massive, huge company. Um, they're just making big changes in the company, and I think they're, they're absolutely worth sticking with. GNC, we got more aggressive on. It hasn't paid off so far. Here's Haynes Brand, which we uh, added recently. And uh, so far, I'm no good, but it's okay. Uh, HMNY um, is the movie, the movie pass people. We love them. Also doing badly so far. Um, but but I, 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 I actually probably number one trade I would take in this portfolio right now is this one. Because it's much cheaper than we came in at. And it's a, it's, I think this could be like a 10-bagger company. Um, H&R Block usually does good in tax season, not so good so far. IMAX, the, the, the movie coming up, Infinity Wars, is going to rocket these guys. They're already in good shape, though, so it's not a big deal. Actually, they're over our target, so it doesn't really matter what they do. Um, LB, as we said, is not, is not having a good time. But the way we have the spread, it's fine. We're actually even on the spread, or a little bit, maybe, maybe down a thousand bucks. Um, so we're not too concerned. And nothing to adjust there. See, we're in the same place we were last. But you know, it's funny. There's nothing to adjust. It's nothing to really do. Northern Dynasty is a uh, is a flyer that we that we're hoping will pay off another ten bag potential, but so far not good at all. <laughs> so far, they're not showing their potential. Um, they they need uh, they they're, they're in a whole regulatory thing. It's going to take forever to unwind and deal with. And for now, we're just hanging on and seeing what happens. Analy Capital is a REIT. They're, they're good. And uh, we only, oh, we're being aggressively long on them at the moment. SunPower just had good news. That's good. And we're considering covering them in the very near future, especially if they get up by 10, 10 again. Uh, SQQ is our hedge. We talked about that. Um, THC, Tenant Healthcare, is, is a complete home run out of the park. Um, they're, they're way over our targets. TZA, another hedge. Um, VRX is uh, fine. They, they're coming. They're actually looking good now. Um, they're 17.52. Our goal is 22, but we have a $15 call, and we're we're nicely ahead already. And wheat and precious metals is a nice way to play silver. And uh, at the moment, well, oh no, we're up a lot. So I can't play. You can't play this one. I do love them though. I mean, they're they're up six. They're up five thousand bucks already. Um, <laughs> we're just getting started, so. That trade's got a long way to go still. Huh. That's a good trade. Wow. Because <laughs> we only half covered and we made a wide spread. So it's gonna make it's good for it's twenty thousand dollars in this thing potentially. All right. So that's the thing. I mean, th that that's the point, by the way. You know, this trade will make twenty thousand dollars. We went, we we're in the trade for um, it'll pay back twenty thousand. We're in the trade for 11 minus 5, so let's say about $6,000, and it's going to make a $14,000 profit. So that's more than it's a 2, 2 230% return on the $6,000. And so far, we're up $5,000 out of 16,000 we expect to be out of, uh, out of 16,000 we expect to be up or whatever it was. So When you have gains like that to look forward to, all that has to happen is that your portfolio gets on track. And the, and the gains are, as we see here, spectacular.
you know, 11%, 12% in a quarter is spectacular. And this is a conservative self-hedge portfolio. And again, like the like the um, like the money tour portfolio, I have found through trial and error, it does not pay to make quick adjustments in seeking alpha, which is where which is what this portfolio is for. So the people over at Seeking Alpha, um, they're just not engaged enough, and they miss the trades all the time. Last year, I tried to do aggressive quick trades, and everyone got lost. So I stopped doing that, and now we do like basically. We, you know, we make a, you know, make a few new trades during the month, but they're basically just like to acquire something, and then we'll do our adjustments on a monthly basis, like we usually do. Um, but we don't do the quick in and out trades, like I know my PSW guys can do, and that's why the short term portfolio in PSW will do that day trading kind of stuff. But we do not do that on Seeking Alpha. It's just people want people just aren't there. They're not, you know, they're not in the chat room all the time. They're there once in a while and they miss everything and, and it makes a complete mess of the portfolio. So, you know, that it's, this is not geared as actively and it's a self-contained portfolio where the hedges are, are in this portfolio, not two separate portfolios. And again, that's just because it would be totally confusing on Seeking Alpha to do it that way. You know, I, I much prefer the long-term, short-term strategy, I much prefer because the point of the long-term, short-term strategy is a long-term portfolio is a portfolio you leave alone and let it do its thing. The short-term portfolio is your active managed portfolio, which has very few positions that you actively trade. That's what your job is during the days you come in. That's the portfolio you trade. The long-term portfolio just sits there and makes money. You're being the house and you're selling premium and over time it just gathers money. All the short-term portfolio does is protect the long-term portfolio from short-term catastrophes. Other than that, it has no other, it has no real function. So whatever you feel like doing with the money while you're sitting there is fine. The butterfly portfolio is very conservative. Makes it's not likely to make 40% like the other guys do, probably closer to 20, 30%, but it's very conservative playing. We, we're always playing both sides and self-contained. That's, I mean, you know, probably for retired people, that's the best portfolio. And uh, then, I, like I said, the, the, the options opportunity is a combination of both. And the money tour portfolio, even though it's up incredibly, you know, 70% um, since September, which is, you know, really good performance, um, it's, it's a non-touch. It's not, I wouldn't even call it a low-touch portfolio. It's literally once a quarter we make an adjustment. But again, it's because the it's because the underlying fact of that is that the long term strategy works. We sell a lot of premium. We take positions that are basically in the money. We do an artificial buy right. We'll sell some puts. We pick good, solid, long term plays, and we don't go crazily aggressive on them because the system works. And if you play the system and let it do its thing, it's going to make you some stunning returns. But you have to give it the time to work. And the, and the nice thing about the money tour, money tour portfolio is it forces you to give it time because we only touch it once a quarter. But even the long-term portfolio, you know, we, we barely, last month we made one change in the long-term portfolio, one change in a month. So in the last two months, there's been one change to the long-term portfolio. And, and looking at the picks that we have now, I bet there won't be much more, there won't be too many changes this month either. What are you going to change? You know, when you're up 17% in a quarter, what do you change? It's like, it seems to be going well. The only thing we would change in the long-term portfolio, most likely, because we like all the stocks, is we would add more hedges to protect it better. We'll take some of that profit and hedge it better. But again, like I said, when you're up $155,000 on $600,000 in, 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 in not even four months, I, what I would rather do is take the $155,000 and take a vacation. <laughs> All right, last couple of questions, then we got to go. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Oh, oil. Forgot about oil. Oh, over. What did I say I wanted to do? 60? Is that close enough? Hmm. 59. Let's see, 60. 40, 134. 40, 136. 
That's a lot of uh, contracts, actually, for uh, after hours. 87, 90. These guys are really pushing. Oh, yeah, there you go. I'm going to take that. Oh, wait, wow. 50. He's chewing them up. There's a big, there's a big buyer here. Probably the Saudis. There we go. Oh, what? Ugh. Oh, no, 45. That is what I wanted. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought I was going to get 50. Somehow in my head I was thinking 50, but there's no way I was going to get 50. So 68.45. So now I have four short 68.45, and I'm not really inclined to change it. I'm going to wait and see what happens tomorrow. So it's risky, but I'll see. I just think the I think that there will be a, a sell-off. It snaps back. Uh, Helios and Matheson Analytics, uh, regular uh, substantial data. Yeah, uh, I, are you sure that's not a um, you know, one of those filing statements that you know you have a disclaimer in the filings? Um, it might be something blown out of proportion, anyway. We know they're spending money, we there's no question about it. We know we're going to get diluted, we know they're going to raise more capital. That's their business plan. They know they were going to burn this much cash. It's like Netflix. The more subscribers they get, the more it costs them. Or, or Amazon or Tesla. <laughs> well, Tesla, Tesla's stupid, though. <laughs> it's different. Um, but anyway, so that, that, that is effectively their business plan. Walgreens Review OOP. We have, we have it. Wait, do we have Walgreens in the OOP? Uh, no. Um, did we actually officially put it in? Did I miss something? Maybe I missed one. <sighs> Walgreens, Walgreens, Walgreens. Um, if I meant to put it in, I did not officially put it in. I'm, I'm looking at Seeking Alpha right now. I've never made a thing about Walgreens. Do we, we have CHL, though. Yeah, we do have CHL. All right. I don't know what the mystery is with Walgreens. We'll have to look at it later in the week. Walgreens is in the LTP. Yeah, I know that. I just don't think I don't think we ever put it in the OOP. Anyway, we like them. But um, maybe it doesn't fit. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more trades in the, o, in the LTP than the OOP because it's five times bigger. Um, doesn't mean we do five times more trades. We do twice as many trades, basically, in just bigger amounts. Um, also, that means that some things are appropriate for the LTP that aren't appropriate for the OOP, like IBM. Like, you don't want to play with, like, $100-plus stocks, you know, not many of them, if you're in a um, in a small portfolio because it wipes out, you know, all your cash. Um, here's Walgreens here, and that's in, you know, basically it's still good for a new trade. And we did the um, 60 75 bull call spread with the short $65 puts. Um, let me see. This trade cost $2,600 in cash, and it pays $15,000 back. It's not bad. Um, five times 65 is $30,000. Probably hit you for $15,000 in margin. Um, in, a, in a small portfolio, maybe, maybe $5,000 in margin, actually. Um, Hmm, because right out the money, too. So is that worth it? Yeah, I don't know. So, so for that. All right, so I'm adding anyway. Okay, just understand that. Just be careful what your margin is on something like that. Because, again, you don't want to have too many heavyweight stocks that are hitting your margin because it, it, it decreases your flexibility. You know, there's, there's a reason I pick some things for the uh, LTP that I don't pick for the uh, options opportunity portfolio. You know, I like to have ones that have like a little bit less of a hit on the margins if I can. Anyway, all right, so we're going to wrap it up here. The indexes are going nowhere, nothing exciting going on. Uh, oil has pretty much stopped there, hopefully. So, all well, so let's see. To review, I'm liking oil short at the 68.45 average price. And that's one we will take into the weekend. Well, not into the weekend. The point is the contracts expire. 
Friday afternoon at 235. Between now and Friday, I expect a 50 cent drop. That's all I want. Get back to 68, take the money, or at least put set tight stops at that point. So that's what we're hoping for there. Um, gasoline, not worth touching. Natural gas, not worth touching. Nikkei, uh, the indexes, I don't mind shorting up here, but we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, so, so certainly no immediate action. And then utilities and silver, we looked at at some point. Where'd they go? SI. You know, that's a good read. If you have silver, I certainly would start taking some money off the table at 1720. That's a lot better than we thought it was going to go. All right. So hopefully that was educational for everybody, and we will do it again next week. All right. So take care, everybody. Thank you.